I didn't get the memo on having a, a joint speaker with me, so I can, maybe I could, or any volunteers, does someone, no? Okay. All right, hello everyone. My name is Henry Daggett, and I'm the design systems lead at Society Generale. I am obsessed with design systems, but let's be honest, they're pretty draining. I made a little bit of a chart to explain this. So yeah, so on this axis here, we've got excitement levels. And coming down here is, is time. And I think it looks something like this. <laughs> Where what we have, we start off with a pretty big high. And I think the absolute summit of that is with the version one release. You know, like everything shiny and new. And then things start to get a little bit serious. Nothing works in production. You've got like hundreds or millions of bugs to fix. And then you've got to like write release notes and do all the boring stuff. And maybe things get even more serious than that because you've got to deal with like governance and contribution and things like that. So yeah. All the while, the amount of work is consistently high. You know, like once we release version one, like it, there's no drop off, you know. So we're dealing with this sort of like drop of excitement with a consistent amount of So yeah, so I joined Society Generale somewhere around here. <laughs> I've been at SOCGEN for about four years now. And yeah, so I got to see really sort of like the during and the aftermath of this amazing sort of big version release that we made. And it was really, it was like such a high, honestly, at the start. But I really sort of got to see, especially with sort of other contributors in the team, their excitement levels to dip, their motivation levels start to dip a little bit. And what I'm sort of getting at here is that there's a very much a palpable before and after of this version one release. And everything after this version one release, where we sort of get down here where there's maybe like a bit of a heartbeat of excitement, it's not totally dead. But yeah, so what I'm calling that is maintenance mode. So you've had a release, and then you kind of just go into like this infinite maintenance mode. So yeah, here's what I'm gonna talk about. You've got a few points. So the first thing is like the right mindset. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to sort of have fun when we're still surviving through maintenance mode. Dealing with feedback and of course managing your energy. So yeah, so having the right mindset. And I feel like there's a lot of sort of variables when it comes to mindset. But yeah, the first thing to do is accept that that version one that you've just released might be a bit suspicious. A little bit dodgy there. And, and yeah, I feel like once you've established that in your mind, then it's a good mental place to go forward. This is our picker component. It's a data picker, combo box, whatever you want to call it, you can search and then you can select things. And I'm just using this as a good example because it happened not too long ago. So we released this component about a year ago and we did a ton of work on it. It was probably the component that had the most amount of design work, research, and everything like that that went into it. And we were happy. We sort of press play. We get it out there. There are like four or five projects who are immediately ready to use it. And the feedback starts coming in that it's not great to use. It's difficult to integrate. And it's kind of difficult to work with. And there's bugs and things like that. And Honestly, that news was kind of crushing because we'd really, really, really pushed for this component. Like, it was a lot of work. And yeah, it was hard. And what that was, it was because we thought that once we'd released that first version, it was done. And so the advice here is sort of at the start, adjust your definition of done. And what you should do is adjust it towards continuous work, focusing on usability, not just for the end user, but also for the people who are actually integrating it, your designers and developers and things like that. All right, talk about fun. Like I said, so when energy levels start to come down a little bit, I think that fun is one of the things that you can always turn to. And, uh, and yeah, so I mentioned writing release notes earlier. It was a bit of a killer for me, and I know you guys are all reading this now, but I'll get to it. I really struggled to sort of, in our sort of two week release cycle to continuously write release notes. And it was like boring. It was definitely getting me down at some points. So I dealt with it with a bit of humor. So I started sort of writing in my own personal brand of sort of like slightly sarcastic puns going in. 
And so, yeah, so for, the, for, the, for one of our pickers, we had this sort of ongoing joke about Shadow DOM, if you know what that is. It's a sort of technical thing with web components. But yeah, so our picker sort of became this character who would sort of haunt London's rainy streets at night. And, <laughs> and yeah, so, and also we had sort of things like this, this second line here, in case you can't read it, says, honestly, we surprised ourselves with how much we got done this week. So yeah, and those are sort of like our general release notes to clients as well. So everyone's seeing this. And it just sort of added a bit of levity. And honestly, it helped sort of motivate me to write more and more release notes. And yeah, so just to sort of give some social proof on this, I suppose. This is from one of our developers. I think he actually left SG and he messaged me specifically to sort of out of the blue almost to talk about this. And he said, yeah, he definitely remembered the release notes. And yeah, it makes people want to read them. And this was kind of unexpected because when we started writing the release notes, it was like, hmm, it's kind of for me, it's kind of for the team, like it's a bit of a laugh. But in fact, what happened was is that more and more, it started spreading. Like people started knowing that we're writing jokes and things like that. And it's sort of more and more people spread. And suddenly people knew there was a picker update because they remembered the sort of rainy London scene joke. And so it was great. So it was just something small like that that actually started to have a bit of impact. So yeah, so the summary here, I think, is that people will read good communication more. So it's worth it, you know? And also, meanwhile, you can make those boring tasks fun. If you guys want to ask me questions afterwards about if you have a specifically boring task, I'm sure we can think of a way to make it funner for you. But yeah, and then on the second point, which is a little bit more serious, actually, design system budgets can be cut at any time, you know? Like, things can happen basically from whatever, from whatever angle. So making things like communication, like remembering things to sort of have as ammunition, value ammunition, I'm going to call it, to show to stakeholders, I think is super important. So yeah. All right. And also, when it comes to release notes, before we move on, I've got to show this amazing thing from Maria Christopher over at the Uber design team. I hope people remember this video from a long time ago, but it's like this guy combining things. So yeah, they're announcing maybe their Taj component. I don't know about that, but yeah, it's just sort of, <laughs> it's just sort of like uh, another thing. You know, you can have fun in lots of ways. <laughs> All right, cool. Dealing with feedback. Once you've released version one, if you are still pre-version one, I can tell you your feedback is coming and you should encourage it. However, it is killing. We recently passed 4,000 issues in our feedback repo, we use like a GitHub repository to collect all sorts of feedback. So we're past 4,000. And actually, I think I, oops, sorry. I think I looked at 4,000 like two weeks ago. We're now at like 4,500. So to give you some kind of an idea of the velocity that we get here sometimes. Yeah, and we have a way of prioritizing. And I'm totally ripping off Dan Moore here. I totally buy into this philosophy. Add a component, and in this case, not just a component, maybe a bug fix, maybe a feature request or whatever, to a design system when three or more teams need it or are using it. We definitely do this. For the picker, for example, I think we had at least six teams who are asking for a data picker. So that was prioritized like pretty much instantly, right at the top of the list, like high business value, it's prioritized. Obviously, there's some variance here. If a project with like, that has really, is an important business impactful project has the use case for it, and it's not too big, we might bump it up to the list just for them. So it's that kind of thing when it comes to prioritization. For those things that you can't prioritize, what I recommend is communication and transparency immediately. People will be okay with even a really long delay. Like this comment here was from January, and I'm telling this person that we're not gonna be able to do this until April. You know, So if you think about fast two week sprints and product cycles, that's a long time. But we were transparent immediately and people were okay. So if I just read it out, this is kind of how I structure telling people this. We've added this to our backlog. So I'm telling them that it will be built in the future. We're currently focusing on some secrets, which I can't tell you, until April. So there's a date. So we won't be able to prioritize it until then. So that's kind of how we're giving. And there's also another line, which I'll get to later, which is if you'd like to work on it yourself and contribute, then we can assist you with that. But I'll talk about that in a minute. So yeah, here's our philosophy. Do everything you can to not do. And I don't mean that in a lazy way, because 
obviously we're not trying to evade work here, but I want to give some sort of strategies. Number one, is there an existing solution to their problem? This is something that I think largely comes with experience. I know I'm way better than this after four years, sort of have seeing lots and lots and lots of different use cases. And it's something that I think I pride myself on, which is being able to find some sort of existing solution to basically everything. I'd estimate to say that we kill maybe 50% of our feedback tickets this way by giving them something that they can already use. Two, is it an isolated use case? So this is the case where someone's come with something that we're like, yeah, okay, that's cool, but we don't really want it in our design system. But we're okay for you guys to use it. We actually label those as snowflake cases, you know, because each snowflake's unique. So that's kind of the vibe there. And yeah, so we say, all right, you can use it, and maybe we'll come and give you a design review. So it sort of aligns to the system guidelines and things like that. And then number three, which I sort of touched on in the ticket before, can they do it themselves? And this is an amazing way to recruit contributors. Ask them, yeah, can you just do it? And then suddenly, they sort of start the path of integrating themselves into your design system. And you've suddenly found people who you can use. So yeah, I think this is a really valuable way. And so that's why, with basically everything that we have to work on, I'm like, yeah, do you guys fancy using pull request or whatever for us, please? <laughs> so it's something like that. All right, managing energy. So yeah, so I spoke, obviously, at the beginning in the graph. We're talking about motivation. We're talking about energy-related things. And I think that people come at really the core of that. So I'm talking about collaborators, and I'm talking about maintainers. And I like to think, so when I say maintainer, I'm talking about the people who are on your design system team. We have a design system council set up, so we don't really call ourselves a team. It's a, it's a council. But yeah, maintainers are the people who are the ones pushing things. So the ones who are working, doing most of their time on the system. And when I talk about contributors, those are people from product teams who just sort of come and maybe help with one or two things, you know. And I like to think that the interaction is something like this, where, <laughs> where we've got a fresh contributor, this husky, who is dragging us out of bed in the morning. And I think if you take this mindset to working with contributors, can be really beneficial. <laughs> so yeah, and I've got a few tactics to sort of share with you guys about how to manage working with contributors. And the first one is give them the enjoyable stuff. When it comes to design system work, there's a lot of stuff in there which could be perceived as boring. I don't want to name names, but <laughs> documentation and things like that. But uh, there are definitely some things which are less exciting and I'll talk about working with a designer because that's what I can really relate to. When we work with, when we work with a designer sort of in particular, I want to give them the things, I want to play to their strengths. Like if they're a product expert at what they do, that's great. I'll give them that work and they'll start working on it. They'll go through all of the sort of things that we love about product design. So things like the ideation phase, the initial user testing and sort of all of that fun stuff. And then the council will take over and work on things like documentation, but also more of the systematic stuff like states, like working with all of the different states that our components have got to have. So yeah, and this was a quote that I loved from Erin from the Zero Height Hiring Report, which is that the whole systems thinking mindset is something that's not easily understood. So when we're working with a contributor, why are we putting all of that stress on them when a, we can just do it ourselves, and B, it gives them a way better experience as a collaborator anyway. So yeah, happy contributors, happy maintainers. Feed off each other's energy. I can't express that enough, especially when you're deep into it. Also, this is, could even be a section on its own. I mentioned that we have a council structure. This means that, I mean, I won't really call it an election process, but it's kind of like that we are able to give maintainers a break. If someone is super fatigued, we just rotate them off the council and back onto a project. And it's a great way to give people sort of like new life in a way. So if you can in your team structures, if there is someone who's just absolutely flagging, like they're not enjoying the work anymore, why not rotate them onto a product team for a bit? And maybe they stay there, maybe they never come back. But if they do come back, we have this amazing thing that they've experienced using the design system in the wild. 
You know, they have all of that amazing experience which they can then feed back into the system. And it's someone who has an intricate knowledge of the design system, who has then gone, worked on a product, seen firsthand that everything that they've built is kind of crap. And then they can come back and tell you about it. So it's perfect. <laughs> All right, we're getting there. This is the end. All right, acceptance. Bit dramatic, but yeah, anyway. How often have you written to your utility companies? And I'm talking electricity, water, Wi-Fi. These are, these are the sort of monopoly cards I could find. Telling them what a good job they've done. Has anyone ever told them, your utility company, that it's done well? Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. But as soon as it stops working, how many seconds when your Wi-Fi stops working before you're looking for a support number, right? So yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of the vibe here. And what we really started to notice was that our design system is being viewed as a utility now. And in some ways, that's great. And it's actually exactly where we want, we want our system to be there. Because I think it's a good sign of maturity. It's a good sign of adoption that people are basically taking it for granted, taking it as something that is constantly there with constant service. But there's a downside to that, you know, which is that we only really receive negative feedback. And there's a lot of sort of wider issues that I'd love to talk about. But I think that Lauren Lopret at one of the last year's Clarity Conference had this amazing talk called Design Systems Burnout. She talked a lot about sort of the wider use cases around burnout and sort of a bit more of the context. So I'll leave that QR code until I see no more phones if you want to grab that. It's a YouTube link, so it's going to start playing out loud if you open the link. I'll just let you know in, in advance. But yeah, so shout out to Lauren because she had an amazing contextual talk on this and I highly recommend. While we're on the topic of external talks and things, check out Society General's Design Medium blog. We've got lots of articles. I will say that this talk started out as an article. So if you're wondering about all the things I've talked about today, yeah, we've got it. Medium.com slash Society General Design. And there are lots of things that we're writing about and communicating about there. So a bit of self-promo, but hey. All right. This is kind of my last sentiment that I want to give to you. Look after yourselves. Like, we've shown the work can be tough. We've shown the work can be kind of brutal. Like, give yourselves a break, you know? And also, give your maintainers some love. You know, like people in the design system, give them some positive feedback every now and again. Like tell them when you're using their beautifully designed button, which they've spent like two years working on, tell them that it's great and it works. And the visual alignment's good, maybe. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. This is great. <clears throat>